Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. My name is Renate McNay and my guest today is Rachi Ray. Hello Rachi. Welcome. Rachi is a meditation teacher within the Tibetan Buddhism and he is the lineage holder of Shökyam Trungpa Rinpoche and he is also the founder and director of Dharma Ocean Foundation. Rachi wrote several books. I'm going to show you one, I have only one here, Touching Enlightenment. Then uh, other books are, let me see, The Secret of Vajra World and In the Presence of Masters and uh, Buddhist Saints in India. Another one, Indestructible Truth. Wow, many books. And um, there are several wonderful uh, CDs out. I have only two with me, and one is the Mahamudra, and um, one is Meditation with the Body. And there's another one I have, which I absolutely love, which is uh, the Breathing Body. And uh, I discovered uh, Reiji about a year ago, and got his CDs, and started to do his meditations, and they were incredibly helpful for me. And I actually thought this work is a missing link in so many uh, of the teachings I know about. And um, I was hoping then that one day Reiji is coming to London and uh, to Conscious TV. And I checked every time his newsletter. And all of a sudden, two weeks ago, I saw Rachi is coming to London, and I ran into my husband's office, office and said, Rachi is coming, and I was so excited. Well, here he is in London with us now, and we're very happy to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. So when I, when I received this book, Rachi, Touching Enlightenment, underneath it says, Finding Realization in the Body. I was intrigued. Mm. And I wanted to talk with you about that. Mm -hmm. What does that mean, finding realization in the body? Well, in the Western world, we tend to approach spirituality mainly as a mental project. And the problem with that approach is it's not experiential. One of the things that has been uh, true for me throughout my whole life has been very interested in spirituality, but when it comes down to a direct and full and transformative experience, that has always escaped me. Um, when I started practicing Tibetan Buddhism a long time ago, probably about 40 years ago, um, I gradually began to explore the somatic practices of the esoteric tradition, and I realized, as you said, this is the missing piece. Um, not only for Buddhism, really, but for spirituality in general. When we focus on the body, then we, uh, all of a sudden, our practices become fully and completely a matter of human experience. And as we know from trauma theory and from uh, depth psychology, it's only human, actual human experience that changes people. Ideas don't change people, and mental practices don't change people. So it was really quite a revelation for me, and mm -hmm. it's a very happy work that I'm engaged in. Yeah. You, you mentioned that there was this realization one, one day that uh, in meditation is no path. Yeah. You, you, you did not change. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, well, how, was, how, how long into your meditation practice did you find that out? After how many years? Well, this kind of crept up on me. I, uh, I've been meditating since high school. Yes. And that's, um, you know, 60 years ago mm -hmm. I started meditating. Mm -hmm. And it was largely, it was mainly mental. And it was using what we might call left brain techniques, you know, applied with a particular kind of uh, intention and idea of what I was going to get. It was really a left brain activity, mm -hmm. the conscious mind. Did you get something? Of course, yeah, you yeah. do. I mean, those practices are not uh, without value. They do help you calm down. They do help you attain a state of mind that is a little bit more peaceful and open. But when it's not grounded in the body and in, the, in, in, in its relationship to the unconscious mind, then you don't change. And that, that crept up on me. I had 
some mentors in my 20s um, that were almost um, forced a kind of uh, somatic consciousness on me, some people that helped me a great deal, but I didn't connect it with meditation until later. When I was in my 30s and I was really practicing Tibetan Buddhism, I began to realize, wait a minute, when I do the somatic practices, then my meditation is much more embodied, and I'm, I'm meditating with my body rather than with my mind. And that, that was when I realized what was going on. Mm. And uh, is this, you, you studied the Vishrayana and, and Tibetan yoga, so yes. is that part of uh, this lineage? The path of this lineage is Vajrayana Buddhism yes. that um, originated in India mm -hmm. around the 4th or 5th century and yeah. was kept alive in Tibet. Yes. But Vajrayana Buddhism in, in Tibet is not very well known in its practical form in the West. And yeah. um, yeah. a lot of uh, teachers teach it, but they don't teach it as a somatic discipline, and it really is. The Vajrayana mm -hmm. is all about the body. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate to meet a teacher named Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, yeah. who uh, actually lived in London in the late 60s. And he taught a Vajrayana that was embodied and that came from the esoteric traditions of East Tibet. Mm -hmm. So that's my lineage. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, when I found out that this uh, Shukim was your, your teacher, I read up about him and he was very controversial. He was very <laughs> controversial. And, you know, truthfully, he was kind of a nightmare to be around sometimes. I was wondering about that because he made some really interesting, let's say, interesting things. <laughs> How was that for you? Well, he... I met him in 1970. Yeah. And I was in my late 20s. Mm -hmm. um, he was a man who had... There was no filter in terms of his insight and in terms of what he, how he was with people. And I personally was terrified to be around him because it was like sitting next to the noonday sun. And at any moment, with a little gesture or a word, he could completely expose your ego trips and your posturing and your trying to position yourself, you know, in the situation. He was very, very frightening to be around and it took me you know, I worked with him for 17 years, yeah. and it took years before I could be in his presence without going into uh, a panic attack. <laughs> but he was, the interesting thing about him was he was very controversial. He, mm -hmm. he drank a very great deal, mm -hmm. but strangely enough, it never seemed to really affect his awareness, so that was strange. Yeah. He um, had sexual relationships with some of his closer female students, but they seemed to think this was like, they used to tell me, you know, Reggie, you know, too bad you're not female because you, you will never have that intimacy with him and you'll never be able to um, share his state of mind. I beg to differ, by the way, but, um, you know, that we can with him. <clears throat> He's just very odd. But that was the least of it. I mean, he was so unconventional. And for him, speaking the truth and pointing out the truth and cutting through your deceptions, your self-deception, that, that was all he was about. Yeah. And it just made him very difficult to be around, frankly. So my question, that what comes up in me is, how much was he embodied? To be able to, to do all the things he was doing. Mm -hmm. You know, how, mu how much was he embodied? I think he, he, I don't think disembodiment was an option for him. Right. Somebody once asked him, using different language, um, do you experience moments of embodiment? We're using our language now. Yeah. And he said, basically, I experience once in a while moments when I'm not disembodied. Uh -huh. And he was like that. He was kind of like a mountain, frankly, mm -hmm. sitting around him. Yeah. Now, some people didn't feel that way. I, I don't know how they got through the day, but some of his close students, what's the big deal? I mean, he's not very frightening, but I personally found him... Um, very challenging to be around, mm -hmm. but also, I mean, I learned so much from him. That, that was why I was there, because of what I could learn. Yeah, yeah. It seems that people who are completely free, mm -hmm. and he sounds like that, mm -hmm. you know, through nature was just manifesting through him in whatever way, and he had the freedom to go with it, 
they are frightening to be around. They are frightening, and isn't it inspiring? Because it's, it's unpredictable. <laughs> it's so unpredictable, but it's so inspiring to be around someone like that. You realize, yeah. wait a minute, maybe I could do that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, can you? <laughs> I'm working on it. Yeah. So uh, through the somatic uh, meditations, um, did it come easy? I mean, you have a very powerful mind. How was it to start working with your body? How was it to living in, in this body? Very challenging. Yes, yes. Very challenging. Um, you know, to tell the truth, when I was about 19, um, I had experiences of complete disembodiment where I would just leave my body and go up into space. And at that time, you know, I was uh, Episcopalian Church of England, and I thought that was what spirituality was about, was mm -hmm. leaving behind the heaviness and the um, confusion and chaos of ordinary life. That's what I believed. And it's been a very long journey since then, which I won't go into the details, to realize, wait a minute, that's actually the opposite of, of where life is found. Life isn't found you know, reality isn't found up in the space somewhere, it's found right here. Yes. So it's been a very slow process, and uh, if you talk to my wife, she'll tell you, that he, you know, he, he's coming along, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know for myself it's not, it's not easy, it's so, like, I mean, I find it so much easier to go into the absolute reality than... It really is, isn't it? Being here and experiencing my body, and mm -hmm. um, it is hard work. It is hard. Yeah. Until something switches. You know, when you do the, pr the somatic practices, mm -hmm. um, and you were there, you know, for our weekend, so you experienced some of it. But when you go into your body, there comes a moment when your left brain just goes offline. Yes. And then you're there within the vast, empty, open terrain that the body opens up for us. And then it's, it's very joyful. And often, it's, it's quite interesting that I will do these practices as I did this past weekend with beginning people. Mm -hmm. And some people, they completely get it yeah. immediately. Yeah. Uh, experientially, I, it's interesting. I got it actually through uh, deep suffering. You know, yes. I, uh, one of my sons died a few years ago, oh, my oldest I'm son. Sorry to hear that. And uh, I, there was nothing, I, I just could not escape the pain. Exactly. And yeah. I remember lying on the floor yeah. and just going inside and inside. And I put on Moses Requiem, yeah. which guided me into. And you know, there was this point where it switched. It was like I was walking through a gate. Yes. And that there was just beauty. Yes. And um, I was never separated from him. That's o so beautifully said. Side. That's it. That you just yeah. described it. Yeah. You go in so far and then there's a switch. Yes. And all of a sudden the whole universe is open to yes. you. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And um, yeah, sometimes we learn these things through great suffering. Yeah. It's, you know, that's a very important point. I think you can do a lot of meditation and somatic practices and body work, but when you begin to realize your own suffering and the suffering of the world, that's really when you start to catch on, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So let's talk a little bit about what embodiment is and um, your experience with embodiment and uh, our listeners, uh, you know, who are not familiar with, you know, your, your type of work, um, meditation with the body. So how do we do it? Well, let's first talk about how we do it in the world, because one of the big yeah. questions is, okay, I have my meditation. But how do, I, how do I bring my meditation into my life? Yes. That's the big question for everybody. Yes. Yes. So I'm going to start with in relationships. Let's talk about that. Okay. So let's say we are having a, um, a conflict 
mm -hmm. with our spouse. Yeah. And both of us get very heated, and all of a sudden, I'm in my um, eight-year-old traumatized state of mind and I look at her and I see my mother who never loved me and doesn't care about me and is always too busy for me and she's in her mind of her mother was always trying to put her down and never saw her and never acknowledged who she was so uh, normally what happens is um, we play out this scene until we're both exhausted in, in normal circumstances mm -hmm. but with the what happens when we use the somatic approach, getting from the meditation, is you go, okay, I'm activated, I'm triggered, I'm dwelling in what um, psychologists, uh, neuropsychologists call uh, implicit memory. I'm gone. I'm not here. I'm not really seeing this person. So there's some dim awareness that that's going on. Not much. Mm. You go into your body and you what the practice does is it teaches you how to know what your body knows and so you go into your body and you let your body look at this other person and what you see is you see the very small slice of reality that you've been operating in during this fight and then you see the whole picture of who this person is mm -hmm. that's what the body knows you know we know this from neuropsychology that um, the body itself receives all the information that's available in the environment. The body doesn't have any boundaries at all in terms of its own awareness. And so you begin to, um, you know, it changes your whole point of view and you, you no longer can be so invested in your small version of reality. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly the same in, in spiritual practice where all of us have a an idea of what spirituality is, what enlightenment is, and um, what freedom is, what peace is. And these are all ideas, they're memories. And we got them from reading, we got them from talking to people, we got them from our own experience. And so we use techniques to try to get there. That's a very, very limited approach, just like during the fight, it's very limited. When you come into your body and you breathe into your lower belly or you develop awareness of your heart, or you begin to uh, relate with the tension in your body directly and let go of it, all of a sudden, the body takes over the journey mm -hmm. and you're not orchestrating it from your limited ego standpoint anymore. Mm -hmm. And the um, experience that happens, if, if I can use an analogy, I don't want to get too far out here, but uh, use this on the weekend. In astrophysics, we have black holes and they look like they're <clears throat> they look like they're small, they're circumscribed in space, but some people theorize that when you go into a black hole, there's a whole other universe that's limitless. Well, the body is exactly that way. When we, when we begin to develop internal awareness, we see it's not, it's not contained in the envelope of our skin. It's actually a gateway to, the, to infinity. And that's, that's very hard for people who haven't done this work to get. Mm -hmm. But it's also documented, you know, throughout the tantric tradition for sure, mm. throughout history and in other traditions as well. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I do your earth breathing meditation. Yes, how, do you, first, find, how do you find that? I, well, first I was amazed because um, you normally go up and up and up in yeah. meditation. Yeah. And then here I am lying on the floor and you take me down and deeper and deeper and deeper. Deeper and you're right, it's a whole universe. Isn't it? Yeah, and mm -hmm. and it's you know it it just feels home. Yeah. When we go up, we lose the reality of ordinary life, mm -hmm. and some of us think that's the point. When we go down into the earth, we also discover infinity, but it's an infinity that is filled with all the potentiality of life and it does feel like home. Yeah, yeah. It feels like our true being. Yes. And uh, sometimes people do this practice, I don't want to get carried away here, but uh, <laughs> sometimes when people do it for the first time that they end up weeping. Yeah. Because it's such a relief to realize that they can they can hold everything that they are and everything that reality is in a state of freedom yes. and openness and joy. Yes. It's yes. shocking actually. It is, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> so, um, yeah, uh, embodiment, we were talking about him. So what is it actually that embodies? You see, we're already embodied. Okay. The, the natural state, the body is in a natural state of awakening or enlightenment. That's the natural state of the body. Yeah. And what happens to us is we, we carve out a little part of that somatic energy and we separate and we create this uh, false sense of separation because it is a false sense. Yeah. And so in fact, the only thing that happened was we have the impression that we're disembodied. That's our experience because we wall off the rest of it. But the fact is we're already embodied. Awareness is embodied already. Any awareness that appears to be disembodied isn't true awareness. It's ego awareness or uh, mm -hmm. what mm -hmm. uh, John Wellwood calls um, spiritual bypassing or Trung Rinpoche called spiritual materialism. It's not real awareness if it isn't filled with the plenitude of life. Mm -hmm according to the Tantra. That's what makes the Tantra different from some of the other schools, Buddhist yes. schools. Yeah. Yes. So, and through the, through the body practices, we start resolving our, all the things that take us away from this awareness in the body. Well, there's, there's a process. Um, some of the, the basic practices become learning to see, first of all, just to feel the body, because yeah. many people actually tell them to feel their feet and they look into it and they can't feel anything. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a problem. I mean, the feet actually are a whole universe unto themselves. Mm -hmm. So we start by learning to feel, to sense the body. Then the next step is we begin to see the amount of tension in the body. And again, we know from neurobiology that tension is not only what we observe, it goes all the way down to the level of the cells. And some people speculate that cancer actually comes from tension in the cells. They can no longer process because they're so tense. Mm -hmm. And then step three is begin to release tension. And when you begin to release tension, you realize the reason we're tense is we're walling off experience. Mm -hmm. That's how we keep unwanted experience in the unconscious is by tensing against it. Well, the minute you begin to learn how to release tension, then all of a sudden the boundary between the conscious mind, which is maybe one millionth of who we are, and the other 99, whatever it is, other parts, mm -hmm. um, begins to become softer and you begin to receive information and then you begin to realize that the body is actually a limitless field of experience. Mm. So it is a process of mm. coming into your body and realizing what your body really is. Mm. If we talk about embodiment, people think, oh, well, that means I'm just in my, the envelope of my skin and you know, I'm just kind of feeling my organs and I'm just here. But that's not what it is. That's, that's um, only the beginning. True embodiment means that you realize that the body itself and I'll say something that may sound extreme to some of your viewers, but the body itself is coextensive with the universe experientially. Yeah. And that um, experience of one's body as the universe is what happens through tantric meditation. That's what the whole thing is about. Mm. And then you can relax. Yeah, but how, how, do you, how do you let go tension? You let go of tension by going into it. You know how the experience with your grief. Yeah. The only, you couldn't deal with it by trying to push it away. Yeah. The only way you could, and, and grief is a kind of uh, emotional tension yes. that wants to release. Yes. The only way to release it is by going right into the heart of the grief. Yeah. And the same thing is true of the physical body. When you, f you begin to find, for example, in your, let's say, in your left thumb, there's tension. I know I have tension in my shoulder. Oh, that's a good example. Yeah. The only way to release the tension in the way we're talking about mm -hmm. is to begin to work with it in a meditative way by putting your awareness into the tension. And then you begin to realize you gain what we call agency. In other words, you, you begin to realize that you, even though from the outside you think, well, it's just tense and I can't do anything about it, but when you put your awareness into it, 
then you begin to realize that actually you're holding on. You see how you're doing it, but you don't see until you're inside. And then you can let go. Yeah. It's the most amazing thing. Yeah. I experience that with pain. Do you? you? Know? I, sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, I, I just play it around. Yeah. What happens if I don't resist it? Exactly. And I go right. I say yes to it. It's all only a yes. <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. And then it's, it, la it starts dispersing. Doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, it's a, it seems to be an endless process. If I think about, like, every cell in my body has its own story. Mm -hmm. um, do you think one has enough time in, in, in one life to to work through all the delusions and traumas and uh, become fully free and awake? I think it's, um, maybe that's not exactly the right question. Okay. Um, I personally do not believe the purpose of life is to reach an end point of any kind whatsoever, human life or any other kind of life. If you look at the universe, the universe never reaches an end point. You can say, well, we have the Milky Way, that's an end point. And we have the Andromeda Galaxy, that's an end point. But it's not, because these two are merging. Yeah. And then there's going to be a new galaxy, super galaxy. And in the same way, in the, what I see life is, life is a process of unfolding. And each moment of life gives us an imperative about the next step. And so when your grief came up, the imperative was to work with it, mm. to go into it and to explore it and to see where it wanted to lead you. And where mm. it led you was into an amazing place. Mm. But then, of course, there's the next moment and the next project. Yeah. Life is a constant unfolding. Mm. And I think our, you know, when Buddhists teach about ego, egolessness, mm -hmm. what they're really saying is that there is no fixed point in our lives, nor should there be, that life is a process of constant, constant unfolding. It's life and death and life and death and life and death. Even psychologically, we know that uh, we go through cycles. And, you know, I think a lot of times people think the up cycle is really, that's it and that's where they want to be. But if you meditate a lot, you realize the down cycle is so important because it leads to a new and more integrated up cycle. Mm. Mm. There's been a lot of research into the teenage brain. Mm -hmm. um, as I'm sure you know, you probably interviewed people. And one of the fascinating things, we have a 15-year-old uh, teenager boy, and one of the fascinating things is he dysregulates, meaning he goes into a down cycle. He fragments, he comes apart, he falls apart, he has emotional upheavals. And then he re-regulates, and it happens like three or four times a day. And the research is that that's how they grow. Mm -hmm. That's what growth is. It's, it's the light and the dark. It's the, the pain and the pleasure, the happiness and the sorrow going through night and day cycles. Yes. And I think that's what all of life is. And I wouldn't be that surprised. Nobody really knows. But I wouldn't be that surprised if it continues through death and beyond. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't be at all surprised. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this constant cycle uh, you just described reminds me of um, we we went several years ago to a weekend with Sogal Rinpoche, sure, yeah. who wrote the book the Tibetan Death. Or I don't, yeah. And he started the seminar by saying, "We are all tired. Our souls, are, and he used the word the word soul. Our souls are tired." from this constant cycle of coming and going and coming and going. And it was, you could feel the tiredness in the room. But what I experience since I'm doing the earth breathing, the earth breathing is like I am, and I go, come deeper into the moment. Yes. By going deeper into, into my body, Yes. I come deeper into the moment, yeah. and it's almost like the story disappears. It happens. It's true. Yeah, it's, it's like it gets metabolized. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, the, e the ego is the only thing that gets tired. I mean, I think you, yeah. 
You know, um, I find, you know, the more I practice, even though I'm getting older and older and older, the more youthful and fresh and open I find life. You know, yes. it's yes. it's the ego. It's not it's not our soul. I yeah. would dispute, you know, yeah. that point yeah. of view. I think he's tired. I mean, the man works so hard. Yes. I yes. think he's exhausted. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, uh, there's so ma many things I want to talk with you about. Um, you, um, so you already mentioned you did a lot of meditations and um, all together I think you did six to seven years of solitary retreats. It's probably more like 11 now. 11? Yeah. Wow. You know, if you, um, some people go and do a three year retreat and they did three years. Yeah. I do, you know, two or three months a year for 40 years and it adds up. Yes. Yes. That, that was, that's another interesting point. Trunk Rinpoche mm -hmm. um, very much valued ordinary human life. Mm -hmm. And he was unlike many Tibetan teachers in that sense. And I asked him when I met him, you know, in my late 20s, Rinpoche, you know, I, I want to be like Milarepa. I want to go, I want to go on retreat for the rest of my life. And he goes, that's not what we're doing. That's not the Vajrayana. Yeah. What we're doing is we're mixing meditation and ordinary life. And that's the way that's the greatest opportunity you have for realization is in that mixture. So yeah. that's what we do. Yeah. But also I was reading, I think in your book, um, that um, hermits, Vajrayana hermits, they went in caves sometimes for years or sometimes for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering how that works. If you know you are not reflected in life, how can you do all this practice just by yourself? Well, I have the same question, and I'll be honest with you, um, about 10 years ago, um, it came to my attention that, you know, long retreats were good, a month retreat, month and a half, that's great. But when it got too much longer than that, I went funny. In which sense? Eh, you know, I kind of, my mind started going into a weird kind of direction. Right. And I started not being able to see my um, my neurosis and my distortions. And then, uh, so I, I s said, okay, it looks like a month, month and a half at this point in my life. This was, you yes. know, 10 years ago. Yes. I need the relationship. I need my marriage. I need my children. I yes. need the problems. Yes. I need the balance of the checkbook. And I think it's true. And I do wonder, I mean, some of these hermits, um, they live in communities, actually. They don't live by themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, even somebody like Milarepa, yeah. who is known as the greatest hermit, you know, in Tibetan, you know, he's, he's yeah. very deeply loved. He had a whole community of students around him, mm -hmm. and he had 25 disciples, and he had people coming and going. I, I think that's necessary. I think, at, at least for me, and probably for most of the people I know, long, long solitary retreats aren't that helpful, because at a certain point, you're not getting feedback that you yeah, need. that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then... Um, I think only recent, recently you did a 20-day long retreat in complete darkness. Yeah, actually it was a, a, a month long. I've done three of those. Yeah. Why did you do that? <laughs> um, I felt like I had, uh, I felt like I had some, there were some patterns, unconscious patterns, tra traumatic patterns, and I couldn't get to them through my regular practice. Yeah. And I thought if I went into total darkness, which, which is done, you know, as part of our tradition, that um, somehow, you know, maybe this would give me an access um, to these deep unconscious patterns. Because when you're sitting in the darkness, the darkness is your unconscious. Yeah. The darkness reflects your own unconscious. So I jumped into it. Um, I was going to do a week. And then I thought, well, this is interesting, but I need another week. And I ended up doing four weeks the first time. And two-thirds of the way through, um, my deepest trauma came up. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And I thought, oh, this wasn't a good idea. You know, I don't know if I'm going to be able to handle this. And it was very heavy. It was very heavy. But it did open up a whole dimension of my, um, my limited, you know, my limited ego, traumatized ego mind that I couldn't get to any other way. 
And but you know, in the middle of the retreat, I had to call my wife up on my cell phone, yeah. and she had to talk me down. I I got into a state um, of feeling absolute and total despair, and I felt that uh, she didn't love me, and nobody loved me, and my whole life was a sham. I mean, mm -hmm. just about as dark as anything I've ever felt. And I could see for certain that I was too crazy to teach meditation, and that I probably was going insane. So I thought, maybe I better call my wife. Uh -huh. But isn't that interesting? And I find that the same with when something goes wrong with the body, that so where was your awareness at that point? I was aware of the trauma. You were I was aware, aware of, of the, the pain. Yeah. And yet you felt you could not handle it on your own. Well, here's the important point. Trump Rinpoche once said, if you think you can handle it, meaning this kind of work, yes. think again. Okay. The whole point is you can't handle it, and that's why that's why you wall it off. That's why there's so many things we don't want okay. because we have a sense our ego cannot handle it. Yes. But if you studied um, Peter Levine or Van der Kolk or any of the yeah. other trauma yeah. specialists, they will tell you, the Hakomi people, they will tell you, you actually have to inhabit the original painful state of mind in mm -hmm. order to work through it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what the darkness allowed me to do. Yeah. And yeah. I did come through it. Yeah. And uh, it took 16 hours of being, you know, in hell. Yeah. But I came through the other side and now I have access to it. It doesn't mean it goes away, yeah. <clears throat> but I know what it is and I know when it comes up and I can actually work with it more. Yeah. And then I did two more of these month-long retreats in the yeah. next two years, and then I thought, that's it. <laughs> I'm not doing any more of these. <laughs> <laughs> Too dangerous. No, they're not dangerous. Um, if you have a lot of meditation, they're not dangerous. But it's yeah. very, very, as you can imagine, very claustrophobic. You're in a little room. Yeah. You can't go outdoors. Yeah. You have to cook in the darkness, which is really hard. Yeah. Um, you know, I was forever bumping my head on the towel rack when I would try to go take a shower in the darkness. It's yeah. just really physically yeah. really hard. But you also said that you didn't do any praxis. You just were in darkness. That was your praxis. That was my practice. Just come back, yeah. to, come back to my experience. Come back to my experience. Yeah. yeah, over and over and over. Yeah, yeah. But that's Vajrayana. That's all of the Tantra is about learning to come back to our raw, naked, unadorned, non-conceptual somatic experience of life. That's what Tantra is for. Yeah, and that is being yourself. Well, it's really being yourself. I yeah. mean, people think being, I'm going to be myself, this is really going to be great. Being yourself means being the universe. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. it means being every experience that humans, that's another thing about dark retreat. Yeah. You realize that every experience that humans have ever had is going to come through your system. Yeah. during that, that practice and yeah. that's so being oneself in that kind of very vast way is yeah. highly challenging yeah and it comes through unfiltered which means um, it's like the experiencer becomes one with the experience that's exactly right yeah sounds great until you uh, experience until you it, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well, you did another out outrageous thing, but I mean, that would be the worst for me. Uh, Malidoma Somme, um, I read his books, a book a couple of years ago, and um, I realized how far away we are actually from what he was talking about in this book. And I know he was uh, for some time your teacher or he's your friend, mm -hmm. and you did... Um, he guided you through an earth burial. This is true. Oh dear. So how was that? <laughs> well, in, in his tradition, Maldo yeah. um is an African shaman. shaman. Yeah, yeah, African shaman from Burkina Faso in um, Central West Africa. Mm -hmm. And he's, uh, he's uh, probably the man I love most in the world. He, he's a, an amazing I don't see him that much anymore, but he's an amazing person and worth meeting anyone that uh, mm -hmm. has a chance. And in their tradition, they, they do the elements. They do earth, they have a water initiation, fire, nature, um, I forget the other one. And um, one of them is you get buried. Yeah, I think it's the fourth. I don't know. Um, 
Oh, it's it's in his tradition. They don't do air. All That's right. one of the issues okay. with shamanism. There's not enough space, frankly. They don't do space as a separate thing. Uh -huh. So his thing was a stone ritual where you put stones on your body, which is very very interesting. But this one is you get buried, and you yes. get buried beneath the level of the ground, and it's scooped out, and your nose sticks up in your mouth, and other than that, you're completely buried. The whole head is buried? Yeah, except for your nose and mouth. And do you have some space? in? No, the... no, uh -uh. you can't move. It's actually very, very painful because we don't know this, but you know we're always moving, even in bed. And yeah, yeah. but when you don't move your joints, they become very painful very quickly. And I also had a problem was I was buried with a rock sticking into my back. Yeah, and it took me actually. I don't want to make this sound too dreadful, but it took me about ten years of body work to get that issue resolved. Really? Yeah, it it really injured my back, but it was worth doing. So why was it worth doing? Well, 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 how did you come out of it? Well, what went through your mind when you? Uh, what could I have possibly been thinking, right, to oh. let this happen? Well, first yeah. of all, I I really loved him and trusted him, and he felt this would be interesting, you know, to experience. But um, I've always had this very ambivalent relationship with the earth, and with being embodied, and just you know, seeing the sacredness of ordinary life, you know, from as I mentioned before. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought, um, okay, I am going to make a prayer to the earth to come and help me solve this problem and help me to, you know, really connect with the earth so the earth will help me. That was my idea. And, you know, the strange thing is, after, well, first of all, the experience was um, slightly horrific. It, you know, it was from nightfall until uh, sunup the next day. It's a long time. It was, mm. you know, eight or nine hours. And, and you could not give any sign in case you need to get out? Yeah, you could get out. You could. Yeah, there were other people there who were doing right. it. And mm -hmm. you could say, get me out of here. And one woman, after five minutes, starts screaming and yelling. And I thought, this is really not helpful. And then through the night, you know, people would freak out. and. But I thought, this is the only time I'm ever going to do it. I might as well see it through. And mm -hmm. so I was the last one, you know, and, you know, mess myself up physically. But after that is when I started doing the earth breathing, the earth descent, and when the somatic work really began to take was after that experience. So I have to believe that it, it was somehow a turning point for me to s submit to that type of thing. Mm -hmm. But I'm much more, uh, as my son would say, I'm much more chill now. And, um, you know, I, I don't push on it so much as I used to, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And my wife tells me I'm easier to be around now instead of being this, like, fanatic, you know, daredevil, sort of kamikaze spiritual guy. <laughs> I, I'm being more like a normal human. I'm not very normal, but I'm closer. Yeah. So I get a lot of positive feedback now that I'm starting to relax. So it softened you, softened something in I you. I hope so. <laughs> you hope so. Do you, do you recognize on yourself changes? Oh, of course, of course. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, I've actually, I'm capable of being sweet. Yeah. And very, you know, I'm capable of being very soft and sweet and loving. Yeah. But, you know, I still, when my dander, do you have that saying, when your dander gets up? No. That's an American saying. It means when you sort of uh, get edgy and you start freaking out, then I go back to my old ways, so. Yeah. Would you do it again? The earth thing? The bear, earth, earth burial? Absolutely not. Yeah. Nor would I do another dark retreat. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of things I wouldn't do again. Yeah. After all the things you you did, um, which were very intense, mm. do you feel freer in your body, in yourself? Um. I do feel freer, but I, I would actually put it another way. Yeah. The, I don't, you know, I think a lot of times in spiritual practice, we're trying to make our ego feel better. Yeah. So people ask me, was this going to help, you know, my, I mean, they're not using this language, but is this going to help my ego feel better so I don't have to experience, you know, certain kinds of things? And 
I don't think that's the right question. What happens with me is when I go into my body, I experience freedom. Yeah. I experience a freedom that is, um, it's measureless, it's infinite. And it, it brings a kind of uh, fundamental relaxation in life. Even when I'm tense and tight and worried about things, underneath there's this river of stillness that um, is, it's not that I've achieved it, it's the nature of the body itself. And if we are deeply rooted enough in our body, we never lose that sense of space and openness and stillness, that sort of infinite vastness and beauty of awareness. Mm -hmm. And that has made, completely change my life. And uh, I'm so grateful to this tradition that I, you know, accidentally fell into it. It's changed everything for me. And I do believe that the body is the missing piece. And once we begin to approach spirituality through the body, these experiences are extremely accessible for everybody, mm -hmm. however much of a modern person you may be. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is an evolutionary step if we talk about everything is consciousness or awareness? Because, you know, I, I, I was thinking about, uh, um, after getting familiar with your work, there are some Indian saints like Ramana Maharshi or Nisargadatta. I think at that time, when they, be, you know, they woke up or were saints, there wasn't much talked about the body. It was all about uh, waking up here. That's right. And, uh, okay, you know, Nisargadatta Dada died horrific with, with throat cancer. Yeah. I forgot how Ramana Maharshi died. Yeah. Maybe that's, that was the body's way then to release something. Or, or rebalance, know. yeah. Yeah. I think so. So, yeah. uh, and only now I find also with Conscious TV, there are a few people start coming forward. Yeah. Where you feel the body is included. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. As if, if this is where we're going as consciousness. Mm-hmm. Well, I think so. I'm, um, you know, obviously I'm uh, a little bit of a, a fanatic about the body, but my personal feeling, observing the scene and knowing dozens and dozens of, of teachers who are friends and peers yeah. of meditation, I think the future meditation is in the body. And I think the traditions that uh, teach disembodiment as spirituality, they're just basically going to fade out because they're not addressing what people actually really feel already. Mm -hmm. You know, when I, I can go into a, a room of 400 people I've never met and teach these practices and people, they get it. Right away they get it. Yeah. And the reason they get it is because they've changed. The world has changed. We live in a world now where we're trying to push aside ordinary life and to, to disparage ordinary human emotions and sexuality and you know, working and all the suffering of life, that's, pushing that aside is not acceptable anymore. People understand that that's, that working with those situations and finding freedom within those situations is actually what spirituality is about. So it's the people I meet that really convince me that this is, this is the future, what we're talking about right here. Yeah, uh, if we want to save this world too. <laughs> yeah, if we want to save the world, let's not leave that out, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Because it's all this <coughs> embodiment, you know, which completely disconnects us from the earth and yeah. from, uh, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, so beautiful, it's the earth is crying, listen to the earth yes, crying. Yes. There, there is a very, a very, very embodied meditation teacher and always has been. He, he's a great example yes. of what we're talking about. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So, um, yeah, the other thing which I find interesting is um, if there is really, and we touched on that earlier uh, with your emotional process, it is really difficult it's if something goes wrong inside the body, like we are really sick, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I don't know if you are familiar with Adi Ashanti. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So I interviewed Adi Ashanti as well, and he mm -hmm. spoke about, you know, he had this excruciating pain 
one time and he was lying on the floor mm. in the hospital. Mm. They gave him morphine, they gave him all kinds of things, nothing worked on him. Yeah. And uh, he said, none of my tricks worked. Good for him, that's great. Yeah. That's great. And I think it's really difficult to have something going on in the body and stay fully present. And no, it's, it's not. It's not. No. Yeah. Because if you think being fully present is different from the pain, you've got a problem. It's not going to work. Right. But if being fully present means entering the experience you're having right now, no matter what it is, whether yes. it's emotional pain or that's, physical pain, that's the only way. Yeah. The pain actually helps you become embodied. Yeah. Sickness helps you become embodied. Yeah. It's very, very important. You know, when you say something wrong in the body, I wouldn't see it that way. I mm -hmm. think the body, when, we're, when we even injure ourselves, you know, we were talking before about my sports injuries and yeah. other injuries. Yeah. Those things are the body calling us back to itself. Mm -hmm. And even if you're dying of terminal cancer, it's not a negative situation. It's painful and it's frightening, but it's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Nothing is wrong. The body is calling you back into the body to experience what kind of a gate there may be there for you, what kind of transformation happens when you actually give in to what the body's telling you. See what yeah. I mean? Yeah. It's, it's so huge what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah, it's really huge. And even, frankly, um, death is a huge somatic opportunity for all of us. Opportunity, and it should be viewed that way. We mm -hmm. should view death. We're all going to die. Nobody's escaped yet. Yeah. And when we're dying or somebody's dying, we should regard that as the most sacred situation of life alongside birth. Yes. And we should approach it that way. And yes. we should, um, you know, bow down at the feet of people who are dying in yes. pain and be with them because that's a moment when the body will not be denied. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And the Tibetans say that in that moment there's opportunities for liberation and freedom and, you know, realizing the beauty of life. Yeah. So, you know, from the tantric standpoint, it's, uh, it's called absolute positivity. Every single situation is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong, there's nothing bad, there are incredibly painful things, but for us individually, there al there's always another step yes. that's being offered. Yes. Yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. <laughs> um, well, we are coming slowly to an end, Reggie. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is, what was the most important thing you learned from Trungpa? Well, it's what we're talking about today, but yes. um, it's summed up in one thing he said to me. Um, when anything would come up, um, very challenging situations, and I would ask him what to do, and he always said trust. It was always trust. Trust what happens in your life. And if you can trust your life unconditionally, you know, without any reservations, that's the way through. Absolute trust. So what I work with in myself is when I start distrusting something, that's when I kind of come to attention yeah. and come back to my body. Yes. Yeah. You had already, as a child, um, you already, I think you said, eight, you were 18 months, you experienced already the infinite mind. That's right. I didn't know what it was. It freaked me out. But, yeah. yeah. And then later on, you recognized that this was what you were experiencing. Do you think it is easier um, for people, which I call the journey of descent, Mm -hmm. into the body, into the earth, mm -hmm. is when you have the realization of who you are and what, what, what this is all about, like you had. Mm -hmm. yeah. But there was, no, there was no realization. There was just an experience that was outside the framework of right. my parents and my culture. Yes. And m working with people, as I have all these years, I personally believe everybody has those kinds of experiences. Mm -hmm. At the very beginning, mm -hmm. there's a friend of mine who, who was in, uh, she was three months premature, a twin, and she was in an incubator with her sister, and she remembers 
how, what she felt like when her sister was taken out and how strongly, can, you know, taken out for a test. Yeah. You know, though, that kind of awareness in, in infants, it's shocking. She was three months premature and she mm -hmm. actually understood the whole thing about connection and the importance of the other and mm -hmm. before she'd had any nurturing or anything. So I think probably everybody has experiences like the one I did. Yes. Yes. But they don't, they don't know what it is. And yes. if you don't receive the training, it's hard to go back and yeah. recognize. Yeah. 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 Okay. I do want to say one other thing. Please. Um, you know, this uh, somatic work is all well and good. But I think often today we don't realize that in order to really accomplish something in the spiritual area, I mean, we know it for the arts, um, but in the spiritual area we have to train ourselves. And this is something that I never tire repeating to my students that you have to undergo the training, you have to put in the time. But if you do, the payoff is so far beyond anything you've ever experienced that it's definitely worth doing. Mm -hmm. But of course you don't know it at the time, right? You sure. just have to trust your lineage, yes. your teacher. Yeah. Yes, yes. So we need a teacher who guides us. Well, we have to figure out a way to get trained. Yeah. I'm not yeah. saying it's one teacher, but yeah. you have to figure out a way yeah. to go through the training. Yes so you can actually inhabit your body and inhabit the life that you've been given yes. fully. And you said something which, um, which on Saturday at your seminar, which touched me also so much, is when we connect to our human experience, that is where sacredness is. Exactly, very well said. Yeah. Well, Reggie, we have to stop and Thank you very much for coming to Conscious TV. And um, I know you are planning to come back to London and uh, watch out for if you are interested in doing some work with Reiji. Oh, here's the camera. And um, thank you for watching Conscious TV. And we we'll see you again soon. Bye bye. A warm greeting to everyone. My name is Reggie Ray. I'm a meditation teacher and I teach meditation through the body and in terms of the body. Today I'm going to lead you in a guided practice. The practice involves developing awareness in the body. The body, as we say in my Vajrayana tradition, is already in an enlightened condition. The nature of the body is awareness of the unborn mind and through the body we can find all of the freedom, all of the openness and all of the joy that is possible for humans. So to begin with, pay attention to your posture the more you can be sitting upright with a straight back, the better. I'm sitting on the front part of a chair. And put your attention in your lower belly, midway between the perineum and the navel. This is the source the hara in Zen, the birthplace of awareness in Vajrayana Buddhism of Tibet. So find this midpoint between the perineum and the navel in the middle of the body and begin to imagine you're breathing directly into it. You're not bringing the breath down from your nostrils and lungs. You're breathing directly into this midpoint. 
Imagine the breath entering right there as if it were a nostril itself. On the in-breath, bring the breath in to that point. On the out-breath, just relax, keeping your attention right in the lower belly. So now we're going to take a breath into the lower belly. And when we empty, we're going to empty out long and slow, but very, very full. We're going to try to empty out and squeeze the lower belly down to zero. So it requires some exertion in the lower belly. So give that a try for a few breaths. and then relax. We are working with the inner breath here, what's known as the prana, or the chi. We're bringing the awareness into the lower belly on the in-breath, and then opening the lower belly through the intense squeezing down of the out-breath. So now we're going to do 12 of these lower belly breaths. This is a very widely used practice in Zen, Chan Buddhism, and Tibetan Buddhism especially. Okay, so 12 of these medium to full in-breath and very, very full exhalation on the out-breath, keeping our attention on the lower belly throughout. So please begin. As you do this, don't be afraid to really squeeze down and increase the intensity of the out-breath with each succeeding breath. On each out-breath, imagining you're emptying out all of the stale breath in your body, all of the stale energy, all of the disease and emotional disturbance as you squeeze down. And then let's do one more all together, medium to full in-breath, very, very full out-breath, squeezing down the lower belly so that not even a square millimeter, a cubic millimeter of breath remains. And then hold the breath out just for a second or two. Okay, so one more.
and then just breathe naturally. So the last part of the exercise is to put your awareness, I'm, I'm showing you how to open up the space through the body here of your unborn mind. So we're going to put our awareness in the back of our palate, so still working with the breath, and breathing in through your nostrils. Feel the sensation at the back of your palate, the coolness of the breath on the in-breath. And then I want to have you open your mind, your awareness, your consciousness behind that sensation of the breath. So we're opening out our awareness in back of our throat. It's almost as if our eyes are turned around backward and we're looking backward, we're feeling, we're sensing, and we're opening backward. If you notice any thoughts, any experiences coming up, open behind them, open backward, let them go, and open your awareness backward behind your head. And see how far back you can feel into the space behind your head. In fact, your awareness goes on forever. It's infinite behind you. See if you can feel that. Open, let go, let go, let go. Stay back. It's as if you're falling backward into the awareness behind your head. And you're opening to infinity behind you. So this is a practice that you can do if you do any form of meditation, you can do this at the beginning and it will greatly deepen it, make it more embodied, and make the experience more real for you. And you can also do this practice just by itself. In Tibet, it's done just on its own. You might do three sets of these 12-fold lower belly breathing and then open your mind behind you and let your awareness go back and back and back and back. When you do that, you begin to discover there's an ocean of awareness underneath all of your experience. It's peaceful, it's open, and there's no ego in it. And over time, you can begin to live your life from that open, free, joyful space. Thank you.